Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're gonna make this happy birthday card and we're actually gonna do this kind of um, all fluid in one fell swoop because I had somebody bring it to my attention that I kind of edit and rush through some of my card making videos, um, unlike my watercolor videos, and that's because I usually have a lot of the supplies and I'm editing out parts where I'm like getting stuff or waiting for things to dry and all that jazz. So I thought I'd try to do this all in one go so that you can kind of see how a card comes together in real time. This video is brought to you by artneco.com. We're using their beautiful panda scene here in their happy birthday stamp and I'll be giving away these stamps on my blog, thefrugalcrafter.wordpress.com. So make sure you go over there and leave a comment on this blog post for a chance to win. And we're also going to use these um, fun watercolor sheets. And these are uh, just being released today so if you want to check out these and find out more about them you can click the link in the video description and I will link up all the other products uh, in the video description as well if they are still available because I like to dig into the moldy oldies and I like to um, use what I have so uh, so let's just get started the first thing we're going to do is we are going to stamp on some smooth watercolor paper you could also use cardstock for this but watercolor paper will handle the um, the moisture a lot better that we're going to be using but of course use what you have now I've got a tip for when you are stamping um, to emboss so the first thing you want to do is you want to dust your paper with a little um, cornstarch or baby powder and what I did was just made a little pouch out of cotton I actually stamped on it too and I just put my um, my baby powder in there and then I just pounce it and wipe it across my paper and what this does really it just kind of wicks up any extra moisture it takes away the static so that when we stamp our embossing powder embossing I said that weird embossing powder. No editing today, folks. Um, it will stick to the stamped image and not to the other stuff. And here is my stamp. I've got this on a um, uh, Crafter's Companion Rocka Block. I like these curved mounts when I'm working with large stamps because um, it helps me get a really good impression. Now this stamp has a lot of solid images and these can be really tricky to stamp and to get a really solid impression no matter how good quality the stamp is. Like I don't have foam on mine because a lot of times I just put a little Aileen's tacket over and over on the back and um, and just use it like that. So if we have some areas that skip I'm going to show you how to fix that. Maybe I'll stamp it perfect but yeah, what are the chances of that <laughs> on this non-edited video? <laughs> Truth be told, I don't really like editing that much, so, uh, so I thought, well, this will be a kind of a fun challenge. All right, so when I'm using these, I like to put my fingers in the center of the mount, and there's these little rails, and that, these will actually work better with stamps without foam on them. Um, these rails are going to rock on the paper, so it's going to give me a really great impression. So I'm gonna, I like to push with my fingers in the middle as I rock it. That just makes sure I'm really going to get a lot of pressure there. And I got a pretty good impression, but there is some areas that did not stamp. So we're going to deal with them in a second. The first thing we're going to do is put on some black embossing powder. And this is, um, oh, this is in, this is, I don't even know what brand this is. It doesn't matter. Whatever black embossing powder you want to, whatever you want to use is fine. I'm going to coat it really good, but don't worry because all this extra can be reused. And then I'm just going to grab a scrap of paper. And I just got like to shake it a little bit like this to make sure it's going to grab every bit of my ink. And then give it a flick to get rid of any um, misplaced embossing powder. And if I end up with, if I end up with like a big chunk somewhere I don't want it, I'll just go, I could go in with a paintbrush and flick it off, but I usually don't need to if I'm using, um, if I'm using a pouch and I'm about like a my little powder pouch there. So now we're going to heat this. Now I probably will actually take out a little bit of this heating time because this is probably going to take me about a minute to heat up. Uh, as soon as an area gets shiny, you can see it's starting to get shiny there, you want to move it. I don't know if you can see the, the glistening of that, but you want to move it as soon as it starts to go shiny. Okay, this took me about 45 seconds to heat up. I looked at the, the clock as I was doing it. Um, so there are some areas that skipped a little bit. So what I'm going to do now is use this embossing pen. Um, you can get a clear Versamark pen. You could even probably use um, any juicy marker that you have. I'm using this black one because I'll be able to see a lot better. And I'm going to go in and color anywhere I see that, that my ink did not stamp very well. It's just a couple little spots and it's mainly in these larger solid areas. So just any juicy water-based marker, so like uh, your Tim Holtz Distress Markers probably would work really well. I don't know if these emboss it, uh, calligraphy pens are still available, but I know Versa markers are, Versamark pens are, and those are clear, so you could use them with everything. I just like being able to see um, 
where I've gone with the black. So that's why I'm using this. And I happened to have, I got a bunch of these at a yard sale. They were really fantastic. It's too bad they don't, I don't think they make them anymore. And now I'm going to go over again with the embossing powder. It won't take very much. I just dip it right in there and uh, make sure that I got powder stuck everywhere I colored, which it appears that I did. And I will pour that back into the container after I'm done filming the video. I'm just going to set it way out of reach so I don't <laughs> spill it before then. And then we're going to reheat just those areas. Um, if I reheated the whole thing, I might overheat my embossing. And then what happens when you overheat it is you can scorch the paper, actually turn it yellow, or um, you end up kind of searing the powder into the paper and it will go flat instead of being shiny and it will look dull and awful. So, um, so only hit the areas that you need to. Now we have a really solid, um, nice embossed area. That was my embossing gun sliding off the edge. I'm going to zoom in a little bit while we do our coloring. And what we're going to use here is a water brush. It doesn't matter what brand. These are by Mozart. And I liked it just because it had several different sizes. And I haven't used this one yet. The one I used on my sample card was actually a big one from Prima that I'd used like to death. So it was kind of... Um, it was kind of a little, I think a little too big for the job. So I'm just going to go in with a smaller one for this card. So let's zoom in a bit so you can really see the way I'm coloring here. And I'm going to use these watercolor sheets. I'm going to start off with the sky. And I'm actually going to turn my paper so it's a little bit more comfortable for me to, uh, for me to attack here. And I'm going to start in with some yellow. So these uh, watercolor sheets are in a little palette with waterproof uh, plastic, kind of like a film in between, so they don't mess up. And I've been using these because these are like one of the first prototypes. I've been using these for about six months and they're a lot of fun. Um, and I'm so happy that I can really share. I know I've used them in a couple of videos, but I couldn't really share them with you too much without having like a release date. Um, and they've been working really hard to get these kind of out to market. So I'm so pleased that they're going to be ready today. Um, so I'm starting in with this chrome yellow. Now I'm going to go to some vermilion, which is more of like a orangey red. I'm going to add that above and just kind of let it blend together. Um, I just want to be careful as I'm going through here that I don't paint into any of the areas that I don't want to, like onto any of the white pandas. If we do that, if you accidentally get it on one of the pandas where it's supposed to be white, you can use a little uh, gel pen, a white gel pen, to fill that in and it works great. You can go right over these areas here that have the black embossing. The ink is perfectly safe under there. It's not going to bleed and these little barriers that the embossing powder give you actually make it really easy to color because you don't have to worry about staying in the lines. The embossing powder resists the paint uh, once it's dry, once you've heated it. So you, it's really quite easy to do these techniques. And since we are working pretty quickly, if you uh, if you're working on a piece of cardstock as opposed to um, as opposed to watercolor paper, it's still going to be fine. Remember, use what you have. Be creative with what you have. And a lot of times, the cool thing is when you use what you have, you come up with completely new techniques. Now, I think this would be water in here. Maybe it's not, but that's what I figured. They're kind of hanging around a little pond. So I want to get that sunset color reflected in the water here. So I'm using the exact same colors. I love how I can hold this palette in my hand and just kind of flick between the colors there. Um, I think it'd be really fun for like urban sketching or sketching in the kayak. I just have to be real careful not to get it wet <laughs> because uh, because it is watercolors on paper. Um, but I, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of excited about about using this. So I'm just going to go down. I kind of look for natural barriers where I can stop a color. So I'm kind of going where all these little um, lines are kind of creating a little barrier. This I think this this uh, image came from a paper cut an, an Asian paper cut. Um, there'll be more information on the Art Neco website if you go check it out. It's part of a set. There's some really beautiful panda images. If you like pandas, I think you'll really um, enjoy that. All right, so we got those two colors in. And now I think I want to get a little bit of like maybe some purple in the mountains. Since we embossed, I don't really have to worry so much about... Um, about painting something right next to it. I can totally do that because that little kind of valley of or, or raised bit of embossing powder is going to kind of protect it. So I'm going to go up to my violet here. It kind of looks like gold. Isn't that pretty? Um, and I'm going to grab some of that. And if you're worried about a color, because they're not going to look the same on any time you're doing watercolors, usually the color in the palette does not look the same as what you end up painting. So you can always test it on the outside um, where you're going to cut out. So I'm going to cut this out so I know this is just scraps. So I like to test first and make sure I like that. Now I want it a little bit darker, so I'm going to grab a little bit of the slate black 
there. That's kind of pretty. So I think I'm going to do the uh, the slate black heavier mix at the bottom. Just kind of add that in there. And then when I add my violet to it, it's going to blend and give me some really nice colors. Give me that look of kind of far off mountains. And you can do these whatever colors you want. It's your imagination. Um, have fun with it. This is just how I choose to color it because I those are the colors I feel like using in my card. And it really reminds me of some of like um, some Asian prints and artwork that you see those muted there, I don't know, you see some kind of rich colors and then you see some muted colors and just the contrast is beautiful. Now I'm going to pull that color right down in here. So, you know, you do have to kind of make it up a little bit while you're, while you're painting and that's part of the fun. Um, it's fun to stamp a couple at a time. So that way when you are creating, if you have another idea or maybe you don't like the way the first one came out, you can do it again and it doesn't really take a lot of extra work. Now I'm just going to go in with that slate gray for these little they look kind of like stones in through here. Just going to go in and get those. And then I'm going to do, I think I'm going to use a little bit of magenta mixed in with the purple for the little hills and mountains over here. So I'm just going to go ahead and add that like that right on my uh, paper so I can kind of mix it out a little bit. So I'm getting the magenta, the black, there we go, that's kind of the color I'm going for. And since it is watercolor paper, there is a little sizing on there, so it will let me pick it up a little bit. So these colors mix really nicely together. They're very transparent, so it avoids a mud while you're making them. And that's usually what, when you get muddy colors, it's usually because your paint is kind of opaque or chalky. This is pure transparent color, so you get a lovely, um, you always get a lovely mix. There's 16 colors, I believe, and uh, they just go together really nicely. Figured I'd add a little bit of that magenta over here too. Okay, so now I want to go in with some sap green. So again, to clean my water brush, I just kind of wipe it on a paper towel. And I find that water brush tips, any white brush tips will stain with like magentas, purples, and greens. So I'm not going to worry about that. As long as I know it's clean, I'm good. I'm going to use this beautiful sap green, which I've used quite a bit, as you can see. And I'm going to start filling in around the pandas. I'm going to try not to color on top of the panda. <laughs> I can actually go right over the leaves because I can put in a darker green on top of that if I want to later. Just kind of go in and fill in. Remember, we've got those embossing powder barriers, so it's not going to flow out into the sky unless I go over the edge of the barrier. And you know what? If that happens, it happens. I'm not going to fret about it. I'm just going to go in and get the uh, leaves, everything but the flowers and the pandas down here pretty much. And I went outside of the lines there and that will be a great um, place for me to show you how to fix it with a gel pen because uh, it's such a great technique. I think a lot of times we think that we've ruined something if we've gone outside of the lines, but if you just have a gel pen, you are all set. <laughs> My favorite little tricks. I love this color. I love how vibrant these are. But you know what? You can use whatever watercolors you have at home. You don't have to have these. So go ahead and just, you know, make it work with what you have. Don't feel like you have to run out and get these. You can totally do this with, with what you have at home. These are just a nice option if you're looking for something small and portable. Especially if you're a card maker and you're only doing watercolor once in a while, it's a really nice option. Now I think I'm going to grab some Viridian, which is this kind of more um, bluer, darker green. I'm going to try not to add too much water because I want to kind of go over some of these areas and darken some of the leaves. What it does is just kind of kind of brighten things up a little bit. Now I might miss some spots. I'm going to be completely honest with you because the way I have to stand um, to paint so my head's not in the way, <laughs> uh, I know I miss, like I can't see I see a lot of glare, so um, you know, take your time and do, I'm sure you can do a better job than I'm doing. And you can also clean your brush by scribbling it on some scrap paper. I'm going to go back to that sap green because I think that's a really pretty color for the bamboo. And there, so I really like the way that looks, I think that's really pretty. And I'm going to go in with some of the browns, I think I'm going to use some burnt umber here and get these, I don't know if these are just like little rocks or cliffs or just uh, hills or what, but I'm going to go ahead and paint it some burnt umber. 
This burnt umber is quite uh, red. It looks an awful lot like what we uh, Easterners call burnt sienna or transparent brown. And I'm going to add a little bit of the slate black into some of these little bits that look like they could be pebbles. I'm not 100% sure what they are, but I feel like I want a little bit of darker color in there. Okay, so now what I want to do are the flowers. So I really want to make sure I clean my brush well uh, because I don't want to get like brown and black in my pretty flower colors. And I'm going to go back in with magenta. So the, obviously there's a bunch of colors we're not using in this uh, kit of 16 colors, but I don't like to use too many colors in a painting or in a card because it can get a little discordant. And the reason we're doing all this coloring first is because we are going to be doing some fun stuff on the rest of the card and this will give our card a chance to dry while we are preparing everything else. So there is a method to my madness, even if it seems like this is taking a long time to create. <laughs> scribble that off there. Sometimes you get into, um, sometimes you'll have like, say some of that green paint on top of the embossing powder and then when you go in with an opposite color like magenta, it picks up that green that's sitting on the, the embossing powder and gets it kind of um, yucky and brown looking. And so that's what we had there. That's why I just kind of scribbled it off on the edge. I am probably totally over explaining this. I'm going to go back to that chrome yellow that we used in the sky and just give the center of these flowers a little bit of color. And I can see I missed a couple of the magenta ones, so I'm just going to scribble that off. That chrome yellow, I think, is the strongest one. Takes a while to get it cleaned out of your brush. Takes a couple scribbles. Okay, and then I just got a little bit of green. I see I missed a green spot. I always miss something. I missed a little dab of green in there, so I'm just going to go in and do that with the sap green. Okay, now we're going to set this aside to dry. Oh, I, you know what? I did miss a, little, miss a little spot up there. I'm going to go ahead and get those filled in too. I missed a little bit of, um, I think, purpley mountain. Purple Mountain's Majesty up there. So we're going to get that put in. It can be a little tricky to figure out what you're painting sometimes when you are got these paper cuts, but... Um, but there, I think that looks pretty good. We're going to set that aside and let that dry. The next thing we're going to do is make a brayered background, except we're going to do it on top of an embossed panel. So what I have here is a four and a half by six and a half inch um, panel, panel that I've embossed. And um, this embossing folder is by Cuddlebug. It's kind of like, a, I think it was part of like the Asian um, embossing folder set. And it's just got a really beautiful, um, kind of all over pattern and I like the all over patterns personally because I just find they go with a lot more things. I could use this with a bunch of different themes and not just um, an Asian theme card. And then I'm using Kaleidacolor ink and this is one of those um, rainbow dye ink pads and I'm going to use a brayer. And so what I'm going to do here is ink up my brayer and oops I gotta make sure I keep my colors on the right side. I'm just gonna keep rolling it on the brayer until I can see that I have really gotten ink all over it. Now um, this these pads have a little notch. When you store it you want to pull it apart because that's going to keep your ink from migrating but when you're using it with the brayer you want to push them together so that you get that seamless um, kind of gradation of color. So now what I'm going to do is I think I want my lighter color to the outside my darker color to the inside. So I am going to brayer. I'm going to start off the edge and I'm going to roll that on and I'm going to just keep rolling it on until I feel like I've removed a lot of the ink from my brayer. You can do this. This is really pretty on glossy cardstock or photo paper even. It's just a really lovely effect, especially if you do like a resist. Like if I had stamped this, if I stamped my panda in white, for instance, it embossed it or clear and embossed it and then on really smooth glossy cardstock and then I brayed over it with my ink or even on photo paper and brayed over it with my ink, I would get this really pretty um, image where this would, everything that's black would be white and everything else would be this rainbow like kind of sunset color. So that's another uh, thing you can do that's really fun with these. Now I don't need so much ink on this so I don't want to waste it. So what I'm going to do is I've just again lined up the dark end of my brayer with the dark end of my um, of my ink pad and I am just going to ink up that end. There's no point in wasting all that ink. I think brayering does use, it seems like it uses a lot of ink. I don't know if it really does or not but it just kind of seems that way. So now I'm going to turn my paper so it's comfortable and I am going to do this end. 
So if this is this is wider paper, or if I went this way, I would end up with uh, it would have gone all the way back to light again on the edges. But I think I like the way this looks just fine. All right, and then um, you can rinse and dry off your brayer or wipe it with a baby wipe. You just want to get all that dye ink off so that it doesn't go off on your next project that you do. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is adhere this onto a piece of black cardstock that I've cut uh, about a quarter inch larger. I like to be generous with my adhesive when I am, whoops, when I have an embossed um, panel because what because it has all these bumps, a lot of times it doesn't want to stick. So you have you have fewer contact points, so I like to put more adhesive to make up for that. We'll center that right up there. And these are both very thin cardstocks. I tend to use my thinner, cheaper cardstocks when I'm doing these layering um, kind of uh, layers, layering layers, because it's going to add less weight and less bulk and cost less to mail. Okay, so the next thing I'm using is a moldy oldie. Now I'm going to put this away, so I'm opening it up and I'm putting my lid on. Very important, or it will dry out and or the colors will mix together. So, you know, take care of your supplies so they last you. And I am going to use this material right here. This is a die cut felt. Now on this card, I went all the way across with one piece and then I realized I'm only seeing like I'm like, not that, I really, not that I'm really saving that much, but I really only need to put a little bit on each end. But the real reason I want to conserve is because this can get very difficult and tricky to work with. So I, instead of doing the whole strip across, I am going to do two strips of this. So I'm trying to find a natural place in here where the design can be separated. And I'm just going in and snipping this. And I do not know if this product is still around or not. Um, I found a ton of it when I was cleaning up my craft room and I realized that I really liked it so um, so I decided to hang on to it and use it up so that's my story but if it is available I will put a link in the video description if I can find it so with this if you're doing like a long strip of this like on a scrapbook page you want to just undo a little adhesive at a time because this can be very tricky especially if it's the there's kinds that are more bulky like kind of blocky and solid little lacy ones with all these curly cues are difficult they want to tangle up a little bit so you just want to kind of unhook a little bit once you get that down then you can do your next little bit Okay, I've got a little bit unhooked and it's sticking to me, but I think I can just kind of position it down about in the middle where I want it, and then I can pull up the rest. And then I just kind of fuss with it a little bit until I get it how I want it. I was really worried about this, doing like a a real-time video it's like oh I'm gonna be struggling with with this die cut felt for like 20 minutes and no one's gonna want to watch that <laughs> hopefully not that bad now that I've broken it up into smaller pieces oh and you can kind of manipulate it like I had that kind of go down a little bit lower hopefully I can do something similar on the other side maybe have a piece go up a little bit so that it's not um, too unbalanced I'm just going to figure out where I want to break this design. I think I'll do it right here. Like I said, it's not going to save a ton, but it's easier to easier to work with and it will save a little, I think. I just try to cut it so that I don't have any awkward bits so that everything can be used. Like I, I don't waste a bunch when I go to start my next project using it because you probably can't get it anymore. So I, you know, really you know, my little, my inner hoarder really wants to, uh, <laughs> really wants to keep it unused in my museum of craft supplies. Okay. This feels like it might be a little tricky. I feel like I have a lot more little curly cues on this piece. I shouldn't. It's about the same. It's just a repeating pattern, but for whatever reason, it feels more curly. I think I'll try to... stick it down so I have one piece kind of poking up a little higher on this end just so I have a little bit of a uh, just so it kind of not matches but it mirrors what I have going on over there and struggling with curly cues of felt
Okay, sometimes you pull it off in one go and it just works, but other times not so much. Okay, I've got something kind of turned inside out here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Phew. That was a, that was an ordeal. I have a little bit of a felt sticking there. I want to get that poked out. There we go. And I don't think you're going to see that one once I put the card together. All right. And we'll just trim off that little piece. So that's kind of pretty. So now I can decide whether I want that to be the top or the bottom. I think I might make that the top. Let's cut this out and see how it works. Uh, since I have that little area there where I went outside the lines though, I am going to touch that up with a white gel pen. And, all right, and this is the Uniball Signo. It is my favorite white gel pen because it covers really well. And then I can just let that dry and that will look great. You can also go over an area with a wet brush and um, kind of paint it and blot it and then remove some color that way and then if any stain remains you can go over it with a white gel pen. And I'm just going to try to neatly and evenly cut this out with about an eighth of an inch border. All the way around here. All right. And let's see how it looks on our base. Hmm, I'm not sure. I wish I had that a little more centered like I did in the other one. Let me see, maybe it'll look a little better like this. Okay, and then if I put my thanks under there, I think that'll work out just fine. So on the back here, I am going to put uh, some foam squares. I'm gonna use these nice big ones because it'll go a little bit quicker. Um, this is a pretty st uh, pretty thick paper. I don't have to worry about it getting crushed too bad. I know some people like to put the craft foam all across the back and you could do that if you like, but I really think with a thick watercolor paper, this is 140 pound. I don't think it's really gonna get, you know, bothered too much. All right. And you'll see that even though it's cockled a little bit, once we stick it down, that, that tape is gonna do a great job at um, really holding it down in place. So push that down well. And then this, I'm actually going to kind of trim some of the embossing, the um, the double stick tape here so that it supports it really well. So I'm just going to slice this kind of in half. So I have a long, narrow strip right underneath there. That way, I, instead of putting it on the back of the, um, the tag, that way I can kind of figure out how much room I've got there. Now the last thing I want to do for an embellishment is I want to add some brads. Brads are, you just can't go wrong with brads. They're um, an elegant touch, they're um, inexpensive, and I don't think you have to worry about overdoing them. I think they just look elegant and they look nice. But one tip for brads is to poke your holes or use a tiny little hole punch to punch your holes because if you try to shove the legs of the brad through the through the paper, you often um, bend the brad and, it, and you or you pucker the paper and it just doesn't look as nice, especially if you're going through a couple layers like this. Now I could use the brads to attach this directly to the card base, but I actually like to hide the little legs of the brad um, behind, like within the card. So if I just do it on this front panel, I just glue the whole panel down to the card and then you don't see um, you don't see the brad legs on the inside of the card. It's completely up to you though, which you want, whichever you want to do. Um, like if I was making a clear card, if I was using like an acetate base, like which is just like a cl thin clear plastic, then th that would be an excellent way to attach that to the card base without adhesive that might show. Let's see if I didn't do this, if I, then you would see those little backs of the brads on the inside of the card. Not a big deal. It's just a personal preference. I hope that, uh, that I have some beginners watching that are just getting into card making because I think that that uh, this would be a really good project because um, 
because I think it looks great and there's only a few just simple steps that you need to learn. So there you have it. I encourage you to try some of these techniques on your next card. Try brayering on glossy paper if you don't want to do it over the embossed paper like I did here or try, um, try embossing in a different color. Just experiment and have fun. If you did this with white instead of black you'd get a different look and it would be very pretty. You need to do something to the pandas though so they stood out. Um, but again it's just fun ways to use supplies you already have and if you have some of this felt in your stash that you just couldn't get rid of but you don't know what to do with try it on a card I think it gives it an elegant touch and um, I'll be definitely happy to ship these away to anybody now I did want to show you how I did the little label there um, let me just grab a little scrap of black cardstock I saved my leftover pieces of um, cardstock to do little labels like this to do my sentiments because it's um, it's less wasteful and that way I don't have to store a bunch of little scraps or feel bad about throwing them away. So what you do is just ink up your, your stamp with white embossing ink, uh, ink. You could actually use clear embossing ink if you want to, but I find the white's a little easier because I can see what I've stamped. Now this is how opaque this is on its own, which is really nice. I like this ink. This is by Gina K. It is her um, white ink, pigment white. It's probably the best pigment white ink I've used if you're looking for something. Uh, so I could let this dry and it would be fine, but I like to um, emboss with white because you're going to get a much, well let me just show you the difference. This is embossed and this is unembossed. You can see just how much brighter it is when you add the embossing powder. And again, this is just some inexpensive, um, I'll see if I can find the kits that I bought because all these colors came in one kit and it was really affordable. I'll see if I can find those kits for you. Um, so I just put on my embossing powder. I did forget to pounce it with my with my little pouncer, but hopefully it'll be okay. I might have a little few little stray marks, a little stray uh, powder there, but I can get it with my fingernail. And again, you want to heat this. I like to let my, actually when I'm using white, let your heat gun up, heat up for a couple seconds off, off the project. Um, Cause white, I find colored embossing powder as opposed to black just can be a little bit more fickle sometimes. And as soon as it starts to get glossy, you just move the uh, the gun away and there you have it. And you can see how much brighter that is now that I've heat embossed it. And then I just cut it out into a strip and notch the ends and that's all there was to that. Very easy to do. And um, I did put a little more foam tape on the ends on this one instead of just a simple strip because I needed the extra um, foundation under there to keep it from getting crushed. So I hope you enjoyed this beginner card tutorial. Make sure you go over to my blog to sign up to win the stamps that I used here. And um, also check check out the watercolor sheets. I'll have everything linked in the video description, easy peasy to find, and I thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting!